Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank the Rafael de Pina Foundation for uh, its contribution to the spread of knowledge and new ideas, and uh, also for the opportunity to talk to Matt Ridley, a person with a deep knowledge about innovation. Uh, I am not going to debate with him, but to talk about the ideas of his book, How Innovation Works, that as far as we have seen, uh, uh, his, title has, his title has been translated into Spanish as uh, Claves de la Innovación. I have read the book and I can assure you it is a very, very interesting reading, not only for people interested in innovation, but for, uh, um, uh, for everybody that uh, is curious and uh, for everybody that wants to understand the modern world. Uh, it is not exactly a theoretical work uh, about innovation as scientists or engineers uh, might have written it. In fact, it is a combination of uh, history and an understanding of the nature of innovation and how it works. Matt Ridley shows us how innovate, innovations are developed through process of essays and fails, and while doing it, the author shows us that innovators are real human beings that may fail or may be successful, depending on many circumstances, including serendipity. Serendipity is a word that appears many times uh, along the book and plays a very important role in getting success as an innovator. I would like to thank Anthony Boss for publishing the Spanish version of the book. I also would like uh, uh, to thank uh, him because uh, he's publishing truly fundamental works that allow us understanding the world. For instance, uh, uh, Richard Baldwin's The Great Convergence or the Globotic Archival, uh, that thank to Anthony Boss, uh, we can enjoy uh, the Spanish versions uh, because uh, he has uh, published them. Uh, we may say that innovation is a trending topic nowadays. In our globalized world, the competitiveness of companies is critical for its survival. Our living standards depend on uh, innovation, competitiveness depends on innovations, and thanks of uh, innovation, we can solve the major uh, problems affecting human humanity. For instance, famines, uh, Madrid really they devote a full chapter of the book uh, to food and uh, innovations regarding food, uh, to pandemics or climate change. So, Innovation is something that we can easily identify, but what is exactly innovation? Is it science? Is it technology? What are we talking about when we refer to innovation? Lord Ridley, please, can you explain us what innovation is? Well, innovation is the adoption of new habits and new technologies by people. And it's a ubiquitous important widespread phenomenon. Everybody has experienced innovation in their lives uh, and that has been happening for hundreds of years. But I argue that we don't fully understand how it happens, why it happens when and where it does, why it happens very rapidly in some technologies and more slowly in others, and then that changes uh, in the future. I also argue that it's innovation is not the same thing as invention. Inventing a new device is all very well, but you have to make that device available, affordable, and reliable. And that is a process that often takes a lot longer, a lot more money, a lot more ingenuity than we tend to give it credit for. So uh, I see innovation very much as a, uh, as a sort of process that happens within human society, a very collective process. A lot of people get involved in it, it doesn't work if you try and do it all on your own. Uh, it works through the sharing of ideas, the exchange of ideas, uh, and the feedback from consumers as to what it is they want uh, from innovation. Uh, so it's an, an enormously important phenomenon, absolutely fundamental to the world. Without it, we wouldn't have prosperity and we wouldn't have economic growth. But we don't really have a good theory of how to make it happen or why it happens. Uh, and that's why I decided to write the book, to try and start to put together a theory of where innovation comes from. Okay, Lord Ridley, uh, thank you uh, for your introduction. So uh, let me start by a very important question regarding uh, your words, that is, uh, in fact, how innovation works. Uh, so how does innovation work? <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, um, for me, it, it's all about uh, uh, the the interaction between ordinary people and technology or ordinary people and culture and habits in the world. And from this interaction comes uh, a, 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 a tendency to, uh, to experiment, to, for, for some people somewhere to try something new. And uh, this is absolutely fundamental to the process of innovation. It doesn't work uh, if uh, people only try one thing. Again and again, if you talk to innovators, trial and error, experimentation turns out to be a very important part uh, of, of the process. So to give a good example of this, I tell the story of the invention of the aeroplane in my book. And uh, there are two different teams of people trying to produce powered flight at the same time in the same month, December 1903, in the same country, in the United States. One is a man named Samuel Langley, who was a very intelligent, uh, very well connected, very um, uh, politically uh, uh, astute person. He was a, an astronomer. He was head of the uh, Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and he thought he could design an aeroplane. And he went off and did, think, did it in secret, got a huge grant from the US government, launched his aeroplane off the top of a boat on the Potomac River, and it crashed into the water after 20 yards, 20 meters. Um, just 10 days later, on an island off North Carolina, two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright, succeeded where Langley had failed. They got an airplane sustainably into the air, not for very long, but for a short uh, flight. Uh, and then over the next few years, they improved it dramatically. And um, what they had done right, which um, Langley had done wrong, in my view, was that they had done a huge number of experiments. They had been working with gliders and kites and aerofoils in wind tunnels for years and years and years before they even first put an engine on one of these devices. So that they, under, they, they gradually solved a whole series of problems, like how you steer in the air, um, what the right uh, ratio between the height and the, the width of a wing is in, a, in an aerofoil shape. Um, uh, and they had drawn upon lots of other people's ideas. So they had been picking the brains of people all over the world, particularly a, a, a very clever person in Australia who'd done a lot of experiments with box kites, um, but also a lot of people in France uh, and Germany and other places. So it's very much drawing upon the collective wisdom of the world and trying things, experimenting again and again and again, that is the fundamental method by which innovation happens. It's not one clever person going off into a small room and having a bright idea. And I think we actually tell the stories of innovation and invention wrong because we celebrate one person having a eureka moment, as we say in English. You know, Archimedes shouted eureka when he had found um, his breakthrough in how to um, measure the volume of something. Um, and uh, it doesn't happen that way. There, are, It's a much more gradual process, a much more collective process, a much more messy process with a lot of trial and error. And I think if we if we continue to tell stories about genius inventors transforming the world in one moment, we mislead people and in, we actually prevent them trying innovation themselves. I'm a great believer that this should be a very democratic process. Everybody should be involved in innovation. Well, uh, you have talked about uh, a lot of cumulative um, uh, knowledge that at the end results on the success of the uh, Wright brothers. But my question, uh, reading your book, was um, usually uh, people studying uh, creativity, innovation, and so on, used uh, to tell us the story of uh, Florence and the origins of Renaissance art and so on, because uh, explaining that there are a lot of connections uh, between uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and so on, because they live in a city. But uh, somehow uh, Langley and the uh, Wright brothers uh, were uh, more or less isolated in the middle of the United States. So uh, 
how uh, do we need uh, to uh, work in uh, urban areas, in cities, and so on, uh, to have innovation, or it may happen everywhere if we have the proper connections? Well, it, it's true that the Italian Renaissance was a time of great innovation. It was probably the most innovative part of the world uh, in the 1400s when Leonardo and Machiavelli and uh, all these other people were, were operating. Um, uh, Fibonacci is somebody I celebrate in, in my book, the person who basically brought Indian numerals to Europe, a very important uh, innovation, um, not that he made himself, but that he introduced from elsewhere in the world. And the clue there is that these were city-states. These were trading cities. Um, Fibonacci came from Pisa, and his father was a trader. He grew up in North Africa, where he met Arabs who used a different system of counting. And so uh, the, 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 the crucial thing is trade here. A city-state that is open to world trade will pick up ideas, combine them with other ideas from different places, and produce innovations. Because most of the technologies and ideas that we have are actually different combinations of existing technologies. But there is one exception uh, to this that I think is quite important, which is that empires are not very good at innovation. The Roman Empire wasn't didn't produce a lot of innovation. There's some civil engineering innovations, some things like glass and so on. But actually, it's a time of relatively slow innovation over six or 700 years. Um, the same is true of the Ottoman Empire. The same is true of the uh, Ming Empire in China, a very big, dynamic, and uh, uh, powerful empire that effectively crushed innovation, sent it backwards. Um, uh, and the reason for this is because Although empires are free trade zones, so they ought to be good places for innovation because there's a lot of ide ideas coming together through free trade, they tend to be very centralized and they tend to have bureaucracies that try to decide what people can do and what people can't do. And you see this very clearly in the Ming Empire in, in, in China, where every merchant was effectively um, told when he could travel, where he could travel, what goods he must store, and so on. And this is a recipe for killing uh, experiment and innovation. A few hundred years before that, China had a very innovative period, a period when it produced extraordinary innovations like um, uh, printing and gunpowder and the compass and all these sorts of inventions. And that was the Song Dynasty, which was organized on very different lines from the Ming Dynasty, uh, in that it wasn't controlled from the center. Each city was free to... Uh, run itself. It was effectively run by the merchants. Um, uh, and it was like a series of city-states. So for me, the, the ideal st uh, political structure for uh, producing innovation uh, is, is the city-state or, or a conglomeration of city-states, like you see in Renaissance Italy, like you see in the Netherlands uh, a century later, and like you see around the San Francisco Bay uh, in the uh, 20th century. Um, so uh, yes, cities are important because actually much innovation happens in city and even the Wright brothers lived in a city, albeit a small one, Dayton, Ohio. It wasn't as it were the middle of nowhere. In fact, Ohio was actually a very innovative place around the same time. You get the sewing machine and various other things coming from um, Ohio around the same time. So um, cities are important, but but small individual cities that run themselves, not great big imperial capitals, are where you get innovation happening, in my view. Cities are important, obviously, but uh, another question that uh, I want to ask you is uh, regarding to uh, uh, this uh, talking is, are, uh, the institutional, is the institutional framework framework important too, because I remember uh, reading, for instance, the words of Athemoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, how they explain the importance of institutional uh, framework for uh, the developing of nations and so on. It is also important for the developing of innovation. Yes, I think it's definitely true that the institutional framework makes a big difference, that you have to set up a, uh, a society in which people can raise money, 
People can spend money on what they want. Uh, people can um, uh, exchange ideas through societies and media and, and this kind of thing. All these institutions matter a great deal. And you see, for example, in Victorian England uh, or in 20th century America, um, the right kinds of incentives for uh, innovators being put in place so that if you decide to start your own company and uh, make a new device that nobody has made before and experiment in making it better, you will be able to reward yourself. Now, for a lot of people, that means intellectual property. That means patents. You know, will I get a great big um, uh, reward from the patent if I invent something? I actually am very skeptical about patents. I think they don't encourage as much innovation as we think. I think on the whole, they, they encourage monopolies that get in the way of innovation and that we have, um, uh, we see more innovation when patents expire than when uh, they're, they're, they're uh, first granted. So it's not so much about the property side of things that for me, it's more about the, the institutions for the exchange of ideas, for the exchange of capital, for the exchange of investment and for the exchange of people, for people to be able to move. So open uh, uh, immigration for talent is important and so on. Now, if you look at California in the 1960s to 2000s, by far the most innovative part of the world, it also has things going on there that are very specific to it. Not only is it mixing lots of people from all around the world and giving them lots of freedom to uh, do what they want. It also has very specific things like being able to uh, sell a part of your company but still make uh, retain control of it. That seems to be important. So you can write a recipe of a lot of these things. But again and again, we find that countries stumble into the right recipe for innovation rather than design it from scratch. It, it, there aren't any good examples of a country sitting down and saying, we want to be the most innovative country. We're going to set up our institutions in such a way that we are innovative. Um, uh, and uh, we will therefore become very prosperous. There's a, some of that happens, but often it's too centralized, too directed, too much about government picking the winner technologies rather than allowing the freedom of experimentation. One of the interesting uh, ex counter examples to what I'm talking about, perhaps, is China, which is now a very, very innovative country. Does that come from economic freedom? Um, well, it's not a free country politically, but in a funny way, China is quite a free country or has been quite a free country uh, economically. That is to say, if you set up a business for the first time in China, you face very few bureaucratic obstacles of the kind that you face in Western countries, as long as you are not setting up a new political party. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it, it feels to me that China is not an exception to my rule, that the, re the, the institution that matters most is freedom. So uh, the structure of incentives plays a central role in innovation, but uh, there are other kind of institutions, for instance, educational institutions, because uh, you have talked about California, and in the middle of Silicon Valley uh, lies Stanford University, or in uh, England, uh, in the middle of the uh, innovation networks uh, lies uh, universities like Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Birmingham, and so on. So do we need uh, also... Um, educational institutions, proper educational institutions, institutions related with research and development, or not? Yes, we do. Uh, educational institutions are very important, and the role of MIT or Stanford in America cannot be underestimated. But if you take Britain as an example of an innovative country in particularly the 1800s, Oxford and Cambridge plays a relatively small part in that. And so do other universities. You get, you get some significance from the Scottish universities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, in the 18th century. But the great industrial revolution, the, 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 the explosion of innovation in Birmingham and in Manchester 
um, has very little to do with educational institutions. So I think it's important to have good educational institutions to educate people and to do research. But I think we tend to exaggerate the degree to which the original drive for innovation does come from universities. Because we generally have in our heads a model which says that universities discover science, that science is then applied through invention, and that then leads to economic growth. This is called the linear model, that you start with science, you then apply it in technology, and then you produce business. Sometimes that happens, but surprisingly often, it doesn't work that way. You, dis, you invent technologies, and then you have to explain the science behind them. So, for example, vaccination was invented 300 years ago. We didn't have the foggiest idea how it works for hundreds of years. We still don't, I would argue. We have some idea about the immune system, but we don't fully understand why a vaccine works and why another one does not. Or to take another example, the, the, the steam engine was invented before the science of thermodynamics. So for me, it's very much a two-way relationship between technology and business on the one hand and science and universities on the other. Uh, sometimes it goes that way, sometimes it goes the other way. Uh, and it's, it's very useful to have these educational institutions, but not to expect them to be the source of all innovation. I think that's putting too much pressure on them to apply their work. Uh, quite a lot of the time, they, they should be the fruit of science, uh, the fruit of uh, innovation, not the seed of innovation. Um, every time we think on innovators, we have uh, in mind, we keep in mind the image of a scientist or an engineer. But my question regard, uh, after reading your book, uh, because I want you to talk about this, is uh, can common people, plain people, be innovators too? Very much so. I, 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 one of the things I wanted to do in this book was to demystify the innovator, to get away from the idea that only very, very clever people can be uh, innovators. Um, uh, because I think sometimes the way we talk about it, particularly in schools to children, we imply that unless you've got this special blood flowing in your veins called creativity, you can't join the party. And I don't think that's the case. Let me go back to the Wright brothers again. Neither of those two men had a university degree. Their sister did have a university degree, interestingly, but they didn't. Um, uh, uh, whereas their rival, Samuel Langley, had a PhD. Um, there are lots of other examples of really quite ordinary people who made extraordinary contributions. Just today, I was listening on the radio to an account of John Harrison, the, 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 the person who solved the problem of measuring longitude at sea, for which there was a great big prize in England in the 18th century. Um, and he's a humble clockmaker from Yorkshire. And all the grand astronomers, they say, well, we can't give this prize to a clockmaker. You know, he's, he's not someone we invite to dinner. <laughs> but, but, he, but he did. He solved the problem. Um, and the, I also write in my book about a, a relatively new phenomenon, which I think is very interesting, which is, um, it goes by the name of free innovation, which is where ordinary consumers themselves develop innovations that feed back into the technology. So the example I give is of um, uh, parents of diabetic children who want to be able to monitor the sugar levels in their children's blood remotely while the children are at school. And some of them got together, these parents, and developed uh, computer programs that would allow them to do this, um, which they then kind of sold back to the companies that were developing the devices for measuring sugar in blood. Sorry, insulin in blood. Well, yes, it's both sugar and insulin that needs to be measured. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, th this is an example of sort of user-generated uh, in innovation. And arguably, I would say that the internet is a good example of this, that, that the question who invented the internet is meaningless. 
You can say that Vince Cerf played a very important role. You can say that Tim Berners-Lee played an important role. You can say that the people who invented packet switching were crucial to it. You can say that the invention of the computer led to the internet. But these are really only very small contributions compared with the work of millions of different people making little innovations in the way they use the internet that then uh, get picked up by other people, that there is a huge amount of free innovation going on uh, in the internet. It's a bit like the way we invent language. I'm sure the Spanish language is the same as the English language. New words come into it. Old words get, get forgotten. Words change their meanings over time. That's not because there's some clever person sitting around a table with a committee telling us which words we should adopt in this year and which words we should stop using, but because we all do it. It's a collective phenomenon. Um, uh, and so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a tremendous Democrat when it comes to innovation. I think everybody should be involved. Um, another image that we have in mind about the innovator is that it is always it is always a man, a male, and sometimes we forgot, for instance, uh, that now that you have talked about internet and the IT, that the origin of the IT, the basis uh, was uh, in ba was invented by a woman, Ada Lovelace, but nobody remembers or few people remember Ada Lovelace, while many people uh, remember Alan Turing. And after reading your book. I want you to talk also about the role of women uh, in innovation. For instance, uh, previously you have referred to the vaccines, and I remember reading a lot of things uh, of the important role of women in uh, vaccines. So I would like you to talk about uh, yep. women in innovation and why we don't have so many uh, innovators women, at least in the past. Well, uh, uh, it's a very important point. Um, Vaccines are a superb example of this. The person who brought vaccination to Europe from Constantinople was a woman. Um, she was an English woman called uh, Lady Mary Workley Montague. She was the wife of the ambassador. She got to know women in the harem of the Sultan, and uh, she found that they were using this practice of preventing smallpox by giving small doses from a survivor of smallpox to a child. And she came back to London and she persuaded eventually the Prince of Wales to try it. Uh, and and uh, this was not vaccination. It was inoculation at the time or, or, or engrafting, as they called it then. Um, but it led eventually to the same idea with a, with a safer version, which is what we call vaccination. So the, at the very root of vaccination, there are women, because not only Lady Mary, but also the women from whom she picked up the, the habit in, in the harem of the Sultan. Uh, then hundreds of years later in the 1930s, there are two women who I write about in the book who developed a uh, vaccine for whooping cough, for pertussis. And they did this in four years flat in their spare time. They were bacteriologists. They were, you know, Uh, uh, technicians working in this field, um, but this was not their main project. And they did it uh, to the surprise of everybody. Nobody believed them. Everybody said, well, you can't have just invented a vaccine that works against this serious disease that's killing lots and lots of people. It was a very serious cause of death at the time in the 1930s. Um, uh, Pearl Kendrick and Grace Eldering were their names. And, uh, but they had succeeded. And eventually they persuaded the world, with the help of Eleanor Roosevelt as well, uh, that they had made a, a huge difference. Um, uh, as you mentioned also, women have played a key role in the computer industry. Uh, Grace Hopper uh, and other women really developed most of the important software routines that are now central to computing. Why? Because men saw hardware in computing as the important stuff and software as just an extension of, um, you know, the, the work of, of clerks and typists. <laughs> and so they left it to women to, 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 to do this. And, and some very extraordinary women did some very extraordinary things in developing the, the, um, 
the, the techniques of computer programming, the subroutines and things like that were invented by women. So um, there is no doubt that women can play just as important a part as men uh, in uh, innovation. To some extent, they do it a little bit differently. And by that, I mean, they don't make such a big fuss about getting the credit and the reward. <laughs> um, so Grace and Pearl, the two women who invented the whooping cough vaccine, never tried to make money out of it, never tried to claim a patent on it, um, never got rich, never got famous. That was partly because the World War II broke out while they were doing it, so they, it wasn't uh, a big news. Um, uh, so you, the, you don't tend to find women getting involved in these furious legal disputes that often happen uh, in the case of men. So uh, um, the man who invented uh, the, the, the telegraph, Samuel Morse, the man who invented radio, uh, Marconi, um, uh, the, the two people who invented the airplane, the Wright brothers, they spent years of their life in, in court, furiously trying to defend their priority as the inventors of things against rivals. Um, my impression is that women aren't quite so um, apt to waste their time in that way. Um, uh, in your book, you present a lot of uh, people that have contributed to uh, uh, many innovations in many fields. And uh, after studying such a big number of uh, innovators, is it possible to define the main characteristics of an innovator, uh, uh, characteristics, aspects they share, they have in common? Well, yes and no. I think there are some features that one can describe, but I did surprise myself when I was writing this book by finding exceptions to, to, to rules. So to give an example of that, one of the people I profile in the book is Gordon Moore, um, the inventor of Moore's Law, and a person who played an absolutely central role in the integrated circuit, the computer chip, the, the whole story of Intel, and all this kind of thing. An absolute, a, a fundamental uh, innovator at the heart of Silicon Valley for many years, still alive in his 90s. Now, um, Gordon Moore... You know, the, the, the canonical Silicon Valley person is, you know, somebody from an immigrant background who's very unreasonable, very impatient, very um, uh, uh, sort of um, demanding, um, very uh, aggressive, very energetic. Uh, I'm talking about Steve Jobs or someone like that. Gordon Moore is the opposite of all those things. He was born in California, a few miles from where he lives today. He is preternaturally patient and friendly and kind and non-aggressive. He's not unreasonable at all. He's very quiet, uh, you know. So the opposite of Steve Jobs in some ways. Uh, but five miles apart, these two people had huge impact uh, on, on innovation. So I don't think there is a personality that 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 you can say is good at innovation. But I do think that clearly there are features that have to be there. You have to be open-minded. Again and again, inventors try and invent one thing, and then they have to notice that that's not working, but something else is working, and they have to change direction and go in a different direction. So, for example, um, Art Fry, the person who invented the post-it note, the little yellow sticky paper that we all use, um, he was trying to invent a permanent glue for, for paper. He developed this glue that was didn't work. It kept coming off again. Uh, and then he realized that this could be useful in his hymn book when he was in church in choir practice. Um, uh, so he sort of spotted that he needed to change direction. So this serendipity, this, this need to... to, to be ready to change your mind is very important. And not everybody has that. Some people um, just remain focused on the one thing they're trying to achieve and they, they won't move direction. So open-mindedness, um, willingness to share. Again, the Samuel Langley story about trying to do things in secret doesn't work. You have to um, uh, pick other people's brains. You have to put together your head with someone else's head. So, um, uh, 
these are the characteristics that, that you need to have as an innovator. But of course, one of the things I'm arguing in the book is that the person doesn't matter as much as we think. There are 21 different people who invented light bulbs in the same period. Uh, Lodigin in Russia, Swan in England, Edison in America, and ones in Belgium, France, Germany, Spain, everywhere. Uh, and uh, that implies that if none of them had survived, somebody else would have still invented the light bulb. The same is true of the search engine today. You know, if Google had never been founded, we'd still have search engines. So there's an inevitability about certain innovations happening when they do, um, which implies that it that, that the personality can be a distraction. Well, um, another thing I would like to ask you is uh, regarding the innovation, because uh, when we talk about this uh, word innovation, uh, people used to uh, have in mind a new device that solves problems or a new app that solves problems. But one of the most surprising things I have found in your book is that you consider the introduction of potatoes in Europe as an innovation. <laughs> Can you explain this, please? <laughs> yes, I, I wanted to give some examples in the book that weren't machines, you know, that weren't devices, um, but were nonetheless new, new practices, new habits, new things. And as far as Europe is concerned, the potato is an incredibly important innovation. It um, uh, not only provides an enormous amount of food for a given area of land, uh, it also um, can be easily stored. It turned out to be a very good way of feeding armies, so it helps, keeps war going, <laughs> um, uh, and so on. And so um, uh, I wanted to ask the question, how did potatoes get introduced to Europe? How difficult was it? How easy was it? Very difficult was the answer. Uh, it, you know, a lot of resistance. Um, in, in England, the many um, uh, clergymen, many priests were, were arguing, we can't have potatoes because they, they come from a papist country. They come from Spain, which is Catholic, and that's not acceptable. <laughs> you know, so extraordinary reasons. The French were very slow to, to, to take up the potato, and it was only because the Germans kept beating them in, in warfare. The Prussians uh, eating potatoes were, 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 their armies were better fed that eventually uh, they decided on a sort of centralized campaign to try and persuade people to, um, uh, to grow potatoes and eat them. Uh, and Marie Antoinette got involved and she wore potato flowers in her hat to try and uh, uh, celebrate this and to cause people. But of course, the potato comes from South America. It was brought back by the conquistadors from Peru. And uh, it... It's it's used to growing at very high altitudes in the Andes, um, and in the tropics, uh, you know where the the day length is the same all the year round. Uh, so it wasn't automatic that it could grow in Europe. It it, it would it would you know grow at the wrong time of year, etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. There seems to have been a period when it was grown in the Canary Islands. Um, the Canarias uh, for some years in order to change its genetics until it was capable of growing uh, in European uh, conditions. Um, uh, and then um, the, there are some very early examples of people taking potatoes from the Canarias to uh, the Low Countries to, to um, Spanish Netherlands. While, I, while I'm talking about potatoes, I'd also like to mention coffee, which is another innovation that I talk about in the book. Coffee is an innovation around the same time as the potatoes, the 1500s. That comes from Africa rather than uh, South America. Um, again, huge resistance to coffee. Wherever coffee came in, it was banned. Um, kings and rulers were constantly um, making coffee illegal. Two reasons for that. One was because the wine and beer industry didn't like this new competitor <laughs> and they campaigned against it and they often made extraordinary medical reasons for, for, for a ban saying, you know, we have done research and we have found that coffee is bad for you, that it dries out your kidneys and it 
you know, poisons your liver. Um, uh, this is the, a very early example of the precautionary principle in action. Um, but the other reason for banning coffee was because it tended to be sold in coffee houses where the, it could be ground up and the coffee made instantaneously when it was fresh. Uh, and people would go to coffee houses. And when they were there, they would have conversations. And the conversations would sometimes be a little animated because of the coffee <laughs> um, and would result in criticism of the king. People might have a gossip about whether the king was doing a good job or a bad job. So that was why the king kept banning coffee. Uh, particularly in England, you find a, a very specific example in the 1670s, King Charles II bans all coffee houses because he people are spreading fake news in them. That's his way of putting it. Um, in, the, in your book, uh, you give uh, the reader a lot of examples of the benefits of innovation, but uh, why so many people are against innovation? It's a really good question. And I, uh, we think we're in favor of innovation. We remember the adoption of the mobile phone and things like that and say, oh, we, you know, we were keen to have new ones. But actually, there's a lot of technologies that we, we are very suspicious of, that we, that we see campaigns against. Um, coffee I've mentioned already, um, the genetic modification of crops, genetic engineering of, of, of plants is, a, is an entire technology that has been immensely successful in Latin America and North America, but has been almost completely rejected in Europe based on some very precautionary concerns about what it might do to ecology um, or to human health. Now, these concerns are very far-fetched, and they have mostly proved to be completely wrong anyway, but still it's very difficult to get past uh, the, 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 the opposition. And I think there are three reasons um, why people reject technologies in this way or are very suspicious about them. Uh, one is because there are campaigns against it by vested interests, by existing technologies. I've already mentioned how the wine and beer industry campaigned against coffee. You find the same kind of thing going on a, a, a lot of the time, that uh, the pharmaceutical industry campaigns against uh, electronic cigarettes, for example, um, because it wants it has a, a, an important market in, in um, gums and patches for nicotine. So that's one uh, reason. Uh, the second is th uh, that uh, cautionary, precautionary bureaucracies exist, that government agencies um, say, well, we don't know enough about this, so we're going to regulate it in such a way as to not allow innovation in this product because we're worried about what might happen. And that becomes uh, um, very uh, uh, important indeed. And the third reason is, is I think, just psychological, that, that, that human beings uh, do have a suspicion of something new. Now, where the new thing is clearly useful to them, like the mobile telephone, uh, then they say, I don't care. I'm going to use it anyway, because it's so useful that I'm not going to worry that it's going to fry my brain with radio waves or, or whatever their concerns were. So on the whole, innovation does overcome the psychological barriers when it's of direct use to the consumer. But when it seems to be just benefiting the producer, as in the case of genetically modified crops and farmers, then consumers are much less ready to adopt it. Um, but it's, it's not true that we are enthusiastic adopters of all innovations. We are quite often very reluctant. Um, uh, I think that many people know about innovation is that thanks to innovation, uh, productivity uh, increase. And because of this, uh, we uh, improve our uh, living standard. But there are other economic benefits from, and social benefits from innovation. Yes, um, uh, I, I mean I think the, the you know the main one is is that as you say we we improve our living standards through innovation and that way we can afford to um, uh, benefit each each other and so on. I mean one of the big worries about innovation is that it will cause uh, lack of employment, that it will destroy jobs, uh, and that has been a worry for two hundred years ever since the first threshing machines on farms. Um, people have said, oh, these machines will mean mass unemployment. 
And in the 1960s, there was a lot of concern that computers in factories would lead to mass unemployment, that nobody would, would, would have a job in the future. Um, but uh, actually, we found that, that uh, innovation produced new jobs, you know, jobs like software engineer and flight attendant, which you couldn't have before you had computers or airplanes. Uh, and in fact, we can have full employment with um, uh, plenty of technology. Indeed, I think any concern that artificial intelligence is going to destroy jobs uh, is wrong. Um, I, I think it, it's going to augment human uh, actors rather than replace them. To some extent, there will be replacement. Some jobs will disappear and others will come in. But one of the things that fascinates me is how innovation does deliver more leisure without destroying jobs. What I mean by that is that if you look at an average person 100 years ago, when they died at 60 and they left school at 15 and they worked 60 hours per week, they would spend roughly 25% of their life at work. The rest would be sleeping or in, in their childhood or whatever. Um, uh, today, if you live to 80 and you work for 40 years, between you know, education till 25 and then retirement at 65, and you work a 39-hour week, you will only spend about 10% of your life at work, which is extraordinary when you think about it. It feels like a lot more. Um, and, of course, some of the rest is asleep. But so that what that's telling you is that in this mechanized world, you can produce things that other people need for 10% of your time, and other people can produce things that you need for 90% of your time. That's a really good deal. And that's the deal that we have delivered ourselves through technology. A, a very important insight, I think, into what how the, how the world works is to realize that we have moved steadily away from self-sufficiency as an individual over hundreds of thousands of years. So uh, instead of producing the things that you consume, you produce a narrower and narrower thing, very specialized thing. It's called your job. And in exchange for that, you consume an enormously wide diversity of things. Um, you consume the, 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 not only the food other people produce, but the machines that they make for you, the, um, the films that they make that you watch. All of this is available to you in exchange for one very narrow little thing. So when people say, oh, life has got more monotonous because jobs have got more boring, I, don't, I think they're forgetting about the fact that most of life is consuming what others produce for you. And that's got much more interesting for us. So that's, that's one of the great benefits of innovation. And uh, a last question. Um, I would like to ask you uh, about a country like Spain that is an advanced economy, that is uh, formally a democracy, that is a member state of the European Union, but uh, the levels of innovation in Spain are uh, not as high as uh, it should be according to our living standard, our GDP, income per capita, and so on. So uh, what a country like Spain can do to foster innovation? I think Europe has a problem with innovation generally. It hasn't been able to spawn any of the digital giants like Amazon and Apple and Alibaba in China um, the same way that, that other continents have. Uh, it hasn't been able to adopt uh, new technologies like uh, in uh, you know energy technologies or biotechnology or any of these things at the same rate uh, as other parts of the world. It is lagging behind on innovation generally. Why is this? Well, in my view, it's because it's trying to run itself as an empire. And the guiding philosophy of the European Union is harmonization. That is to say, every rule must be the same everywhere. Um, uh, and I don't think that works as well as saying, if it's safe in Spain, then it's safe in England, even if you use different ways of deciding. This is mutual recognition. We're not allowing 
the diversification and experimentation to happen that does happen in America because of the federal state system to some degree, uh, and that has been happening uh, in Asia because of lots of different countries doing different things. So in my view, we, we have to move away from a philosophy that everything must be the same everywhere in the continent of Europe. Um, we must allow more experimentation. Now, how does Spain do that on its own? Um, well, uh, uh, the, the, the answer, you know, it's not going to be that easy within the European Union to do it on a big scale, but on a small scale, you can set up different rules in different parts of the country. Give Barcelona a slightly different tax regime than Madrid. Give um, uh, the different uh, uh, trade arrangements, you know, free ports in different parts of the country that, that have different uh, uh, tariffs and so on. Um, uh, reinforce specialization in certain technologies in certain regions and allow them to flourish. So I'm a great believer in, in, in trying sort of differentiated experiments, even in a, in a relatively modest sized country like Spain. I don't know if that would get me elected, probably not, but <laughs> uh, that's not my problem. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Ridley. I must uh, admit that we have enjoyed very much uh, uh, your words, and uh, I strongly recommend it uh, uh, everybody uh, to read your book, that it is very interesting. There are many, many more things inside your book, that apart from the ones you have talked about. And uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Lord Ridley. Mm -hmm.